and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis host of Podcast UFO, and I'm live in the great state of Maine right now. We have some guests coming up. We have Audrey Starborn, we have Dan Brew, and we have Steve Mitchell, and we are in a little office in downtown Portland. We're going to do a round robin. I'm going to talk about the alien slides that were released down in Mexico City, and everyone was looking forward to it. Uh, I think you and I may have had a couple of conversations in the past and ta-da, it happened, and I saw the picture this morning, and I don't like it. I think it's uh, – I'm just surprised that so many people stood behind it and all that. And to me, if it was something that was supposed to be a fresh picture in 1947, why is it so caved in and mummified looking? Um, anyway, you and I have not talked about this at all. So I wanted to hear mm-hmm. what you had to say about it. Well, it's obviously an alien, so I've been researching what type of alien <laughs> okay. that it might be. Um, no, you're right. I think, you know, uh, the, I, we, I interviewed Andrew Adam Dew, one of the researchers, one of the main researchers, a few months ago about this. Once, you know, they announced everything, and once people kind of had discovered, you know, this image, when you and I had talked about it, that uh, was less blurry of the slide, and people came up with this mummy theory. And, uh, and you know, seeing the real picture, even then, you know, Adam D said, ah, wait till you see the real picture. I don't think it's a mummy. Jaime Musan, you know, had contacted us. He's like, oh, that's definitely not the complete fly. Wait till you see it. You'll see, obviously, it's not a mummy. I think a lot of people, now that they've seen the slide, because, as you said, it's called the Roswell slides because there was supposed to be two, but for some reason uh, they didn't display them both. They just displayed one. And it just further solidifies, I think, in a lot of people's minds that it's definitely a mummy. And I think a lot of people are kind of like, well, it's obvious this is in a museum. How could you guys think otherwise? Uh, You know, John Greenwald wrote a, wrote a great story from the Black Vault about all of this, and he points out that you can see some other artifacts right. on this display. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. One of them looks like even an ape or a gorilla head uh, or something like this. And then you can see, you know, and we had talked about this even with the blurry one, you could see a person on the other side. It uh, looks like a woman in a skirt. Um, interesting enough, you know, I, I when I spoke with Adam Dew, he talked about how there were some other pictures they found in this set that they were looking to get more information on. One of those pictures, and they have a couple of them posted at his website, which is Slidebox Media, and one of those pictures is a woman at a museum that's wearing a dark blue skirt. Um, it could even be the same woman. So, uh, you know, I'm putting together my story on that, and I'm including it. So, yeah, I mean, it really looks like it's something in a museum uh, there's a researcher out there, Isaac Coy, and people have been posting online a picture that he put up of a child mummy from Thebes. And I talked to him about that today. He got the picture from a guy named David Hunt. I looked up David Hunt, and I found a paper that he wrote about this mummy. So this mummy was discovered in 1856. It was then transferred to a museum in, I think, Philadelphia up until 1957. So it's entirely possible that the slide is from 1947, and it's just, you know, this family going to visit or this couple going to visit this museum and taking a picture of this mummy 
Uh, and the reason why we, you know, people argue, well, if it was a mummy, we'd be able to find that display. Well, since 1956, it was moved to the Smithsonian, and that's where David Hunt had written a story about, he's a, he's a physical anthropologist or about this mummy and some research they did uh, with this mummy, which I guess can now be seen in uh, the Smithsonian. And it really does, I mean, I think that the resemblance is striking. Okay, let's let's talk about something else. Mm-hmm. Here I am, Joe Schmo, and uh, yeah. I hear about I this. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I hear about this unveiling of the slides, and I'm all excited. Like, wow, uh, I'm going to hop on board this plane. I'm going to go to Mexico City, and to see this. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of cash am I laying out for this? Do you have any idea what, what that part of it was? You know what? I've heard conflicting stories. I mean, certainly a plane flight to Mexico City is going to cost you probably about a grand. Um, it's going to cost you, you know, uh, some money to, to stay at a hotel. So it's not going to be a cheap trip. And um, I think it comes down to this. The Daily Record wrote about a quote that they took from actually my interview with Adam Duke, where he said that, you know, other news agencies had wanted to interview him, but he didn't want to talk to them because they weren't uh, offering any compensation. And so uh, a lot of people feel that way, that all they were doing was out for money. Now, what I'm including in my story, because, you know, I'm a softy, is that uh, Adam Duke did try to justify that by saying, you know, I've spent a lot of money on this, and I'd like to tell my wife that at least we've broken even. I'm th- <laughs> sure a lot of us in this field can... Uh, can uh, sympathize where we're spending so much money to do research and all these other things in this field. Often uh, our spouses are not as as, uh, thrilled about the topic. So that was his argument. Um, You know, then they said, well, why Mexico? Why does it have to be, you know, all of this money and all of this big fanfare? Granted, I agree, it's not the most professional or credible way to do something like that. But it's uh, according to, in the same Daily Record story, uh, Jaime Musan, he said he lost $100,000 in this whole thing. And that may be true. Uh, the auditorium wasn't full. People had reported it was about 40% full. And uh, I think, you know, once that blurry image came out that looked so much like a mummy, a lot of the momentum kind of went out of the whole thing, so people weren't as excited about it. But all I could say is, you know, at least we, we don't have evidence that this really this thing is an alien. Uh, I think a lot of people feel it's most likely a mummy. At the same time, I'm not so sure we have ample evidence that these guys tried to hoax. I know especially Don Schmidt very well. Uh, I don't think that he would, uh, you know, try to hoax people, uh, especially to get money. I think he was totally... I think he was totally sold on the idea. I think you're right. I think he was sold. I think Tom Carey was sold. Uh, from what I understand, Tom Carey and John Schmidt did not make any of these profits. Um, and I think I, I feel like I don't know Adam do as well, but I feel like in the interviews he was very forthcoming. I mean, I asked him, do you think this is a mummy? He said, I looked into it, but uh, I don't think it looks like a mummy personally. Maybe it is. So I, I think he was being honest. Uh, I asked him, did you talk to scientists about this? And he said, I did, but whenever you show a scientist uh, or an anthropologist a picture of a of a humanoid that has a head, two arms, and two legs, they're immediately going to say it's human. Well, that's a professional opinion. Uh, of course, Jaime had a couple of, of uh, supposed experts there that said they, they didn't think it was human, but um, so you have expert versus expert here. But I think a lot of people feel like I don't need an expert, and you may feel this way. I don't need an expert to tell me. Well, and to be honest, I feel that way. I don't need an expert to tell me that this is a mummy. Yeah. Well, you know, if this was thought out properly, in my opinion, it would be to get like an anthropologist and like a team of people to really look at it and have everything to display at once. Well, here's our findings. You know, I mean, if it came out good, that is. Um, then do the event if it came out positive. Do the event, set it up, present everything. Yeah. You know the whole spiel. Instead of, I think, I truly think, and this sounds cold, but I think it was a money event or a, a te- intended to be a money event, a cash out um, mm-hmm. by some. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. 
Uh, I don't yeah, know. I was going to say I'm often an apologist, and, and uh, I feel that way in this case because I know some of these guys, and, and I hope that's not the case, but it could be. Um, I can't say for certain, but one thing Adam Dew told me uh, is, you know, that there was a credible scientific magazine that was going to do a story, they were going to do a lot of science, and he told them no because they weren't offering money. And he said, I don't know if I did the right thing. What do you think? And I told him, <laughs> frankly, you didn't do the right thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the research is more important than you getting your money out, in my opinion, and it would have been better to go with them and uh, find out what it really is to get some science done because now we've got all this fanfare. We've, now we've got all this negative press because overwhelmingly people are pretty upset about this whole thing. Uh, including the media, they they even include this daily record, put sale epic in the title or uh, epic sale. I saw that <laughs> in the title, but uh, I think that would have been better because now I I don't know. I think now the public opinion has kind of made up their mind, and I don't think there would be uh, anybody that'd be willing to to go forward with it, looking at it. Yeah, um, you know, I I think it's a step backwards. And, you know, someone just put on the message board a minute ago, uh, you know, it's unworthy of discussion, you know, and, and it, it, it sort of is. But it's like the elephant in the living room. We have to talk about it. Everybody's yeah. talking about it. But it also, I really think, puts a negative spin. You know, I mean, I was contacted by a few people yeah. that aren't into the subject at all. And they're, you know, chiming in, you know, funny jokes like, yeah, it looks like me after I drank too much tequila or, <laughs> you know, something like that. But anyway, yeah. um, I think it is unfortunate, and uh, it kind of makes you say, "Well, here, here it goes again." You know that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, you well, know, and I someone think it's said, important. "It's uh, the ad, it's like someone added water to the Atacama baby." You know. Yeah. Where's yeah. Atacama, Atacama baby? was the number one of these situations, and I, I, uh, I think there was a little bit more deception in the Atacama situation than this one that personally made me concerned. However, uh, what I would say to, you know, uh, the person who said this is unworthy of discussion, it kind of goes back to your hypothetical, Joe. You and I talked about this slide earlier. We talked about uh, the fuzzy picture and our feelings about the fuzzy picture. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, along with other researchers, have been covering information on this. So, you know, to hypothetical Joe out there, you should have heeded our warnings because, you know, we have been warning and a lot of people have been warning. And it's important for us to get that information out to Joe. So, uh, in other words, you know, we've got to get out the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, regarding this build to the public. It is what it is. Um, and hopefully it, it will help people avoid falling in the pitfalls of, of spending money or getting duped. That's right. So if you're listening live, we're live right now, you can jump in the chat room at podcastufo.com. Alejandro, uh, thanks thanks so much for, you know, helping out. And uh, we're not going to do the regular news, of course. And is it next week that you're going to be gone? I'm so confused. Next week I will be on the high seas uh, oh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So, yeah, so I'll talk to you again in a couple weeks. And I'll be in some hotel somewhere in the country, so doing a live okay. show. Okay. I sure hope. I sure hope I'm. I won't to... ask about the details there. <laughs> no, no details. It's not like your Vegas trip that we're not talking about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, don't talk about that. Uh, oh, right, right. Uh, you already paid me for that. All right, man. So thanks a lot. <laughs> so that's it, and it's time to bring in our guests. Thanks, Alejandro, and I'll, I'll be talking to you next week. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. You bet. About a month or so ago i decided to uh, post an ad on the facebook page in maine the state of maine for people that belong to a ufo group and i said hey you know i run shows right in portland maine why don't you uh come to and and uh, right near portland that is but i have a studio available right in downtown portland maine and ask some people to come in and uh here they are um Find a seat, people. So we have Steve Mitchell. Eric. Oh, I'm so sorry, Eric. Eric. I know a Steve Mitchell, and that's why I did that. We have an Eric Mitchell, and I'm sorry. And we have Dan Brew, and we have Audrey Starborn. 
And uh, Audrey, we'll start with you ladies first. Okay. Um, you um, run the Experiencers Speak. Um, this, this one? Yep. Okay. And just make sure you hold it. Okay. It's on. You run okay. the Experiencers Speak each uh, each year here, right? Yes, right Experiencers Speak. Yeah, it's coming up in August. Uh, this year it's at the Fireside Inn on Riverside Avenue. And what's the date of that? Um, August 28th and 29th. Um, 28th, the Friday, we have a big banquet scheduled uh, where we're going to have three speakers that night. Um, I believe it's Tom Reed, Kathy Martin, and I can't remember who else is on the schedule for that night. Um, you can go to starbornsport.com and then hit the events page, conference page, and all the details are there. We also have an Experiencers Speak website, which is www.experiencersspeak.yolasite.com. Okay, and um, I'm sorry, I have to, it's funny when I do these shows, I, I have a chat room going, I'm communicating with the uh -huh. uh, producer and everything. Multitasking. So. <laughs> so your sister is involved in this too. Yes, yes, I'm on and a, uh, you, you've been in a couple of documentaries, and mm -hmm. at least one I've seen you in. And mm -hmm. can you just kind of go over quickly your experience? We're going to go round robin here, just okay. for the people coming in here. And also, again, if you want to jump in the chat room, it's podcastufo.com. You can pose a question. Uh, we're going round robin, and we'll, we're starting right now with Audrey uh, Starborn. So basically. Um, Give us your background. All you right. Know. Well, I'm an identical twin. I'm a lifelong experiencer, um, alien abductee, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've had these beings in my life all of my life. Um, throughout the years, it was very confusing. We didn't know what was going on, my sister and I. There was really, um, you know, we didn't have influence. We, were, we grew up in Athens, Ohio. Um, or had a TV, but I think we watched Tom and Jerry on Saturdays, and that was basically it. So for the rest of the time, we were outside, um, you know, playing and, and you know, doing our thing together. And uh, so we weren't, you know, into the sci-fi. Like people say, oh, watch too many movies. No, that wasn't the case. Um, we did keep journals. We drew pictures of um, what we know today to be the gray aliens. When did you start journaling? Um, probably... Uh, seven, eight years old, we started drawing pictures. We were always um, into art and stuff, so we decided to uh, draw pictures of the things that we would see um, and the beings that would come into our room that we would call the bald men as kids. We would be scared to go to bed and, you know, freak out and say the bald men are coming. And, of course, my parents, uh, you know, would say, oh, there's no such thing and tuck us in. And we were always together, which we were lucky. Most people go through it alone. Um, one day my mom, you know, found our journals and was looking through it and just thought, oh, wow, they've got active imaginations. This is, this is really cool stuff. But, uh, you know, later on in the 80s, she was in the grocery store and sitting on the shelf was Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, and she saw the same face that we drew in our journals. Hmm. So she put two and two together before we did. Really? Yes. And now, was there anyone else in the family that you recall that talked about this? Any um, type of experiences? Well, you know, not at the time, but now, um, you know, as we've come forward and, and started to be a little more open, um, you know, my mother has come forward, um, and she's had recent experiences even. And, you know, through the research that we do, we understand that it goes back through generations. So, um, you know, there's probably... Um, quite a few cousins and, and other family members, you know, that we're just not aware of. Um, people don't like to talk about it. People don't yeah. like to talk about it. You know, it's one of those taboo subjects, um, and we're really trying to break that with, you know, having it be more mainstream and accepted as well as um, just showing the numbers of how many people we work with. I mean, I started the group in 2006, after being asked to do it by these beings. Um, so I really, you know, just said, okay, you know, what am I going to say? No. <laughs> so I did it. And uh, so far to date, I'd say we've worked with over 2,500 experiencers um, from all across the world. And, you know, working in this field, I know other people that do this as well, and they've got the numbers. So, you know, people just keep coming forward all the time. And it's important, um, you know, for the world and the individual experiencer. And that's why we do this conference. You know, it's all about the experiencer. It's about um, educating, you know, the public as well as, you know, helping other experiencers. Um, you know, every year there'll be somebody that comes up and thanks me for, you know, 
giving him an understanding um, about what his wife is going through or what her husband, you know, the other spouse who really didn't know uh, what to do. But just um, through these uh, conferences and, and meetings and the shows, you know, we've done the secret history of UFOs on Nat Geo and uh, alien encounters and uh, monsters and mysteries in America, um, just talking about it. And that's enough to be in somebody's living room and have somebody say, wait a minute, you know, that's very similar to what I've been through. And then, you know, they'll reach out and get more understanding. Um, we run support groups as well, monthly, in uh, several different states. And we're also um, in the U.K. now, in Latin America. So. Wow. Now, what do you, how do you, I don't want to say defend yourself, but how do you handle this? If someone just point blank says, "Oh, you're crazy. You're all crazy." What do you what do you say to that? Um, you know, I, I feel bad for them. You know, and it's not about making them believe and forcing them to. It's about giving them enough information so you know if somewhere down the line, which is going to happen, um, disclosure will happen, and what we've told them will always be in their mind. Whether they consider us crazy now at the time, it doesn't matter to me. I know it's real. I've seen them, I've talked to them, I've felt them, I've smelled them. It is real, and they have been here for a very long time. And, you know, there's many, many people that go through this. So um, just to give them enough information to make them think I'm crazy is enough for them to remember when they realize I'm not crazy. So. Mm -hmm. um, when <clears throat> the, I, I can only picture if this would have happened to myself. That's all I can mm -hmm. do. Yeah, And if it would, I would be so, I think, unless I, I don't understand, I would be so scared and petrified. Oh, yeah. I'd want to talk to everybody in the world mm -hmm. like this is happening. It's got to stop. You know, how, yeah. how are so many people I've talked to that go through this so composed and... and well, it's, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And, you know, the, the main thing that I, when I work with people is uh, working on that fear. Um, where they're completely telepathic beings, that doesn't mean, you know, they just read your thoughts, they feel your emotions, they feel everything. And so negative thought and fear actually, um, you know, affects them in a bad way. Um, now, there's different uh, species as well. So, you know, not all of them are, you know, little gray bald beings. They're very, you know, human-like beings that are, are easier on the, the human mind and psyche to, to relate to and not to um, fear. But, uh, you know, and, you know, the people say that uh, it's, it's so, they're so evil and, you know, they're just coming in and they've got no right to do this. Um, but if they were that evil, why would they tuck us back into bed and why would they remove or, or make us forget about the majority of the things that would harm the human mind? You know, the psyche is very delicate. So a lot of people just are put into that state. I don't know what they do, um, hypnosis. But in seconds, you know, you can forget everything and just have that fading memory of they came. I remember that. But uh, everything else is laying dormant in us. You know, I've, I've been on a classroom setting in a spaceship, and we're there, and I'm with other what appear to be humans, and we're being taught all this important information. And, I, you know, they let me remember the answer to a question I asked, and that question was why – What's the point of teaching us all of this if only to be forgotten when we're returned? And what they said to me was everything that you need to know will be dormant in your, in your mind and will activate when the time is right. So um, the so-called junk area or the you know, unused area of the human brain, which is what, probably 90%, is acting as storage for experiencers. So we've got a lot of information in there. And, uh, you know, there's times where we're activated. Um, some people call it downloading. Um, but the activations do happen, and especially when we're together, there'll be different triggers. And uh, when we trigger each other, the memories will start to activate and, and be put together. So uh, it's, it's uh, important stuff, really important stuff. And people really need to pay attention to this because there is something going on um, in a universal scale. It's not just here. The main thing is that this planet is not going to be allowed to be destroyed by the human race. So, um, you know, that it's time to, to make a change because the planet Earth is very, very sick and very threatened right now. So there are 
you know, they're watching very carefully, and I think they always have. Well, okay, we have a ton of questions coming in <laughs> on the message board. And uh, let's see, I'll try to go back. Uh, first of all, um, and we want to give everyone a, a, a chance <clears throat> here, and we we got plenty of time to do that because okay. I don't know if you know this. Did you know it was two hours? I was hoping it was because okay. one's never enough. Yeah, okay. all right. <laughs> so uh, and next we're going to be talking to Dan Brew. He's, uh, uh, we met actually, I think, through Facebook originally. But anyway, um, the person wants to know, what did they say to you? Is it just many, many things? Oh, yeah. Um, they say many things. But let me see. Um, when they came to me in 2006, this is after a near-death experience. Um, the this, this story, I mean, like I said, two hours is barely scratching the surface. Um, but let's just say I ran for years in fear. Um, I finally, in the 90s, did find someone uh, to help me. Uh, we ran into uh, a man in in a club one night that we were introduced to on a StarCraft 10 years before. He's now our scientist. His name is Matt Moniz. He was also featured in Monsters and Mysteries. Um, he was able to direct us in a way where we could find help. We did um, find someone who did hypnosis very quickly. Um, it really just opened up this box and scared me even more. But um, after my near-death experience in which I was actually saved by one of the human-like beings or angelic beings, that's you know who they are, um, I came out a new person. Um, after a series of events and awakening, as I like to call it, my spiritual awakening, when I started to get the visions and the messages, I moved here to Maine. And in November 5th of 2006, um, a being came to me, and she was one of the human-like beings. They have a glow about them, which, you know, is much like the halos that are portrayed in, in various religious art. Um, she said, you need to start a group and call it Starborn Support. She said, someday the world would know who you are. You would help many, and all involved would become, like, ambassadors for the planet. So, of course, I woke up the next day and said, I don't know what, what she's talking about or what to do, but what am I going to say? No. You know, am I going to say no? No. So I went and I just started a MySpace page and a phone number and walked away. I said I did it. And then it just um, became what it is today from there. And very rapidly um, things started to to happen. And, you know, they did come back to me in 2012 and, you know, showed me what to do with Experience or Speak, which I had never even been to a UFO conference. I had no idea what I was doing Um no idea how much work was involved, but uh, I threw it together in four months, the first one, which we held in Gorham. And, I mean, what could go wrong did, including the venue closing a week before the event after being heavily advertised. So I had to literally knock on doors um, in the neighbor's church and say, you know, can I <laughs> do this? So, you know, it's, it's important um, that, you know, I not only do what they ask, but, I, you know, I focus on it and f- and I don't uh, go at it as a, you know, I'm going to do this with ego or I'm going to do this, it's, you know, it's going to make everything important. No, you know, I don't even speak at my own conferences. I stand in the background because it's not about me. Um, and, you know, the information that they give us, like I said, does remain dormant. We don't get all the answers either. Every one of us is programmed with a little piece of it. And like I said before, when we come together and certain people are supposed to meet and we are you know, brought together in various ways, it's pretty amazing actually to see it happen. Um, and then, you know, say one person has a piece of a message that doesn't make sense um, and you meet another person and the rest of it, you get triggered by that person and then you put the pieces together. So the messages come out making more sense. Um, there's just so much information, you know, for, for a show like this to, to even begin. But uh, basically, the world is in trouble, and uh, it needs to be healed. Um, and the, the way of the world right now is uh, it's going to self-destruct. They're not going to let humans destroy it. Um, you know, we, we do have the technology and um, understanding of how to work with uh, free energy and things. But, of course, the big oil corporations don't want that to happen. And that's just a piece of it, you know. So I guess when truth happens, it's going to be a total paradigm shift 
for everyone. And it has to, you know, and, and for years we've all known, you know, this is not good. You know, yet, you know, today I'm walking through the woods and there's just trash everywhere. I mean, why would people do that? I don't understand. So I picked it up and, you know, now it's in my car. So, but at the same time, there was no trash barrels, you know, but people, you know, they just don't think. And when, when you tell people that, you've, you know, we've got to stop doing this, what can one person do? One person can do a lot. You know, if every one person did it. So it is about, uh, you know, just becoming more aware of, of where you are and, and how important it is um, to be here and to coexist is very important and not, uh, you know, thrive off greed and ego and uh, competition. This isn't a competition. And, you know, when I had my near-death experience I, and I was, I died, I basically I was out of my body in the rip, rip current um, I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, the car in the garage or, or my material things. I was thinking about the loved ones and, you know, the connections I had and how they were going to feel and how I never got a chance to, you know, tell this one that. And my sister and I were kind of, you know, had a falling out. And that's what goes through your mind. It's not what you have materialistically. It's uh, the things that are important are in your heart. And uh, people need to get back to that connection with one another. Okay, um, so we had a whole bunch of questions coming. I have to scroll up, um, and I do want other people to talk. So yeah. I want to make sure. Let me just ask um, a couple of sample ones. I'm, I'm just going to throw a few of them at, and then just if you can quickly answer them, just so we can have some sure. other people talk. And I'm also on Facebook, Audrey Starborn, so people can message me if okay. they need to. First of all, they want to know. I'm going to ask these one right after the other. Okay. Um, do you have a counseling background? Um, if she has seen so many. Where is the proof? Shouldn't they have some sort of artifacts or pictures or something? Another question is, are you and your sister RH negative blood type? Um, another one, why did they choose you? Um, and we'll just... Well, yeah, now. yes on the blood type. Um, as far as proof, um, I don't feel like I'm required to, to present proof because it's not about... That um, what I you know do say is you know people that go into church every day and they they kneel and stand and get up and sit down and you know stand in line and do their uh, ritualistic routines. Um, I want to know you know do they have proof before they go there? Um, the proof is you know my whole entire life and my understanding of things and um, you know it's been happening to me for a very long time, uh, 42 years. So, um, you know, I'm proof. I, I don't feel like I'm required to, but yes, I have many scoop marks and implants and things like that. Um, do I want to, you know, show the world and pull one out? No, I don't. Um, it's, it's more, uh, important than, you know, just the black and white. Um, you know, like I don't, I'm not going to go find a mummy and, and, you know, try to bring that as proof. It's, the proof will come in time, and uh, actually, most people don't even spend any time anymore looking up in the sky because they're glued to their TVs and iPhones and things. So all they need to do is go to a place without light pollution, and they can get their own proof if they just concentrate and ask for it. Um, she says you are required to prove your, prove your claim. but we'll, we'll I'm required that. by who? <laughs> um, anyway, it's just a comment. Dan... Um, <laughs> Welcome, Dan. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to you. We're, this is around Robin. Welcome, Dan. You and I met um, a Facebook, uh, Facebook group um, in Maine. I, I was just on Facebook one day, and I said, I wonder if there's anything going on in Maine. And sure enough, uh, do you admin that page? or is I that, do. So you started that page. I did. I started about a year and a half ago as a way to meet and reach like-minded people. And I was kind of surprised that there wasn't more of a presence in Portland because Portland's kind of uh, more of a bohemian, open-minded type city. Yeah. But uh, I was kind of shocked that there wasn't anything already established. So I did it just kind of reach out and have people share their experiences and meet and greet, maybe get together in person once in a while and discuss it. Yeah. Yep. And... What uh, what got you interested in the topic in the beginning? Did you had a sighting? Or you had sightings, a number of them, right? I did. It started when I was seven years old, and my sister, who was thirteen at the time, 
in Mobile, Alabama, where I grew up. Uh, this was probably a week after Hurricane Frederick in 1979, and my sister and I are standing in front of my parents' house, and all of a sudden, in the corner of our eye, you see something coming over the tree line, and it's big, and it just slowly comes above the trees and above right over our heads, and it's a saucer-shaped craft, just as you expect to see, probably the size of a city block. Mm. Um, it had a red glowing dome, and it had blue and yellow lights on the edges, and the yellow lights were almost pill-shaped, like capsule-shaped, and the blue lights were round. And I couldn't tell if the craft was stationary and the lights were spinning around the craft or if the craft was spinning and the lights were stationary. Hmm. But it made zero noise whatsoever. And recently, my sister and I were talking about it, and she mentioned a detail that I don't remember. And she said the strangest thing about it was you could see the stars behind it. Hmm. It was semi-translucent. I've heard that uh, You've heard a number this? of times when people have talked about you know, the triangle UFOs overhead, they can sort of see like a rippling and like star, yeah, yeah. you know, through, which is, is fascinating to me. Yeah. It almost, when you talk about these type of things, it makes you think about maybe interdimensional or exactly. what, what can it possibly be? You know I mean? And, and I've said this a number of times on my show, it's probably something we can't even think of is what mm -hmm. it really is, you know, can't yeah. even, you know, have not thought of yet most likely. But um, so where was this, and um, was this a daylight sighting, first of all? No, this was evening. This was probably 8 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, where was this? What Was this in Maine, actually in Maine? No, this was in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, okay. You, did you say that already? I did. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> but I remember okay. going in. I remember rushing in to call, call my best friend to tell him to look out his window, which, of course, it was gone by then anyway. But yeah. the interesting thing is... About two years ago, I was talking about it on Facebook with another friend, and one of my sister's friends chimed in, and he says, was this right around Hurricane Frederick when you saw this? And you could have pushed me over with, with, a, with a feather. I yeah. said, are you, are you messing with me? He said, no, no, I, me and my brother saw it too. Wow. And they lived in the neighborhood a few blocks down. Hmm. probably half a mile from where we were. He said, yeah, we saw it going over our house heading towards your neighborhood. Hmm. And we waited up for two weeks. We stayed up late after that <laughs> trying to see it again. Yeah. And that's the only other confirmation that I've had of people seeing it. Yeah. And even more interesting, I keep every once in a while, I'll look online to try to find if there's been a reported sighting back then around that time. And nothing ever came up, but just recently I found that someone reported within that same week in Gulf Shores, Alabama, which is about an hour and a half away from Mobile, seeing in the late afternoon off the coast, seeing a rectangular-shaped craft that had to have been a mile wide hmm. within, within two days of my sighting, I believe it was. Oh, really? That Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I'm almost wondering if, if the two were connected. Well, I, I had... Uh... A uh, guy that's written a book on uh, triangle UFOs, Dave mm -hmm. Marleron, a few weeks ago, and I the topic came up about a mixture of types of crafts, and it's been seen a number of times. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll see a cigar shape along with a disc, and along with a triangle, or mm -hmm. you know, it really is. The more you dig into this, the more puzzling. Oh yeah, it can yeah. be. And so, were there other? You had a sighting since you've been in. The state of Maine also, right? I have. We were in West Paris for 10 years, and on clear nights, you could go up to the top of the mountains there and see the outer bands of the Milky Way, mm -hmm. you know, the dense star clusters. And so we would go out and just lay on blankets and stare at the sky, and every once in a while, most of the time, it was the twinkling orbs you know, that would change color from blue to red to white, and they look like stars glancing at them but when you start to watch them you'll see them start to move around and to sway and everybody says it's an optical illusion but if you line it up to something in the foreground 
you know, have a point of focus and line it up to that point of focus, a tree line or a utility line, and you'll see it move independent of that of that point of, of point of reference. Mm-hmm. And we've seen them. I've seen them come down pretty close to where we live, and then take off. And I remember one night, my wife and I were standing out watching one, and she's she's the skeptical one. She's the scully to my molder, I like to mm-hmm. say. And we're watching it, and she says, "Helicopter? No, no, we would hear it." plane no no planes don't just sit there and hover and finally she said that might be a ufo (laughs) and then she says but you don't see who's driving it (laughs) yeah so you know that's kind of how it goes with her but we would see those on numerous numerous occasions uh we had a daylight sighting once where it was a another saucer shaped craft and you couldn't see Anything you couldn't make out any features because all it was was a bright orange glowing. It was just a glowing saucer shape, mm. basically, that hovered over a street close to where we were for about three minutes and then took off. Wow, wow! So there's there's quite a bit. <clears throat> pardon me. There is quite a bit going on in the state of Maine. I I know that um, I, I can't remember where we rest in the per capita, but it's fairly high. I've seen that. Yeah, I've in seen the, the charts in the states, mm-hmm. and um, I have no idea why. No. You know, I mean, I grew up in Southern Maine, and uh, right, right on the border of New Hampshire, uh, during the the UFO flap or, or wave during the 1960s, mm-hmm. and we were all outside looking. You know, and uh, I saw a weather balloon. That's all. I mean, a, a, a real weather balloon oh, okay. uh, across. <laughs> we're right across from uh, the river from the Air Force Base, mm-hmm. and um, but there was always weird. The Air Force Base always seemed like there was weird stuff going on there. But it was, as a kid, it's mostly my imagination, probably. Of course, yeah. Oh, I forgot. I left out one sighting. <laughs> I used to work at the, at the airport in Mobile, Alabama, uh-huh. and one day uh, while we were out on the tarmac, uh, one of my coworkers and I look up. And we see what I can only describe as the escape pod that R2-D2 and C-3PO left the, the Death Star destroyer in to land on Tatooine. And it, <laughs> it just was, was motion – well, it just hovered right o- above the, the airport and just slowly oscillated. Hmm. And it was gray with – it looked like black and white, some type of markings on it. And it just sat there. It was almost like it was observing or collecting some type of data. Well, you know, I've heard other people talk about that. As a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine's mother in Russia um, talked about viewing something. She said it looked like the size of a washing machine. And it was over and just stayed there. And she said she thought she saw it turning. It was a little far away. Um, Stayed there for hours and Mm -hmm. hours. And they couldn't get anyone to come. Check it out. Mm-hmm. We hear seagulls outside. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're in Portland. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's now um, we want to talk to um, Eric. How are you, Eric? Oh, uh, uh, to, uh, right here. Yeah. Not, not used to radio. Yeah. Just a, a little bit closer. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Getting over a little health problem, but I'm doing fine. Thanks. Yeah, I heard that. Well, thank you for making it down. Absolutely. Here. And um, you know Audrey. You two met. Um, who? Who met who? I mean, how did that all happen? Yeah. Kind of a strange situation, really. Uh, it had to be well, through Starborn support. Yeah. It had to be through Starborn support. Um, I really can't remember exactly um, when we first started talking, but he started coming to the meetings, but he just moved here from Arkansas um, in September, right? Yes. All right. So he came to the conference as well, so... Through Facebook and then ending up here, which um, turns out he was actually from the area where we spent most of our lives in Massachusetts, in the Bridgewater Triangle area. Um, so it kind of went in a circle. <laughs> it's very strange. Okay. So um, can you tell tell us what your um, your whole experience? Sure. Has been? You got to lead me. I'm not used to radio. <clears throat> yeah, um, I have never. Uh, and I want to repeat that, never had any uh, inclination, any thought uh, about uh, the ridiculousness of the existence of little green men and UFOs. I thought it was uh, insane if anybody, you know, brought up the subject. 
roll my eyes, walk away, another crazy person. You know, here's the world. We have plenty of them. Um, unfortunately, that was the case for me. Um, I woke up. I'm an avid sleepwalker. I woke up. Uh, see, that was uh, 2013, uh, July 28th. I believe that was a Sunday morning uh, around 4 o'clock a.m. <clears throat> I woke up standing literally outside my apartment. I was dressed. I had a blue tank top, black slacks, and a uh, pair of Nike flip-flops, I believe, on. And uh, my left shoulder was facing my door. My right shoulder was facing the uh, dead end of the street where I was looking at uh, some kind of light. I thought right away I thought it was some kind of construction, something like that, you know, going on. Uh, And I think it was measured later on to be about 160 feet away. You know, from where I was standing, uh, there was a full investigation for over a year uh, with what happened. Uh, hmm. A lot of things did go on. Um, I, you know, I didn't go, oh, UFO. You know, you, when you're a sleepwalker, you try to wake up a little bit and go, what is this? And, of course, when you're fully awake, you're trying to rationalize what you're looking at. And uh, it was 160 feet away, 60 feet off the ground, and about 30 feet in diameter was an orange spherical light. Um as I thought more about it, I realized it didn't reflect off of anything. There were trees there. There was apartments there. There were, you know, uh, the road right there. Um, if you got to look at something and squint, it's going to make a glowing sensation around everything it's around. And it didn't, and that bothered me. Uh, so after about 20 minutes of, of staring at it, I came inside. It was about uh, 4.18 a.m., and I started the coffee pot, and I sat on the couch, turned on the news, and I'm thinking... I'm just trying to rationalize, you know, I'm just trying to get a good beat on what the heck I was looking at. So I went to the door probably 10 times before the sun came up, you know, just, and it was still there. Didn't bob, didn't weave, didn't move, you know, just stationary. And my idea, you know, 6 a.m., sun up, two hours. I'm going to drink that full pot of coffee. I'm going to see what that thing is, you know. Sometimes we, if I can interrupt you, did you call anyone or? No, oh, no. I mean, why? I was not alarmed or anything. I was just really confused about what I was looking at. There's no way, shape, or form I'm going to jump up and down like a Neanderthal and go, ooh, ooh, UFO. I mean, that's that's to me that that no, that that's not the kind of mind I am. You know, I'm not a sci-fi buff. Never have been. Not going to throw my imagination into the mix, but, you know, I'm trying to rationalize. And after you do that, like arguing with your wife, you can only do it so much and then sit back and wait for the proof to happen. And I don't mean about UFO. I mean about daily life, you know. Uh, You can argue until you're blue in the face. But, you know, once you turn right where she told you to turn and she's right, then you you just take it and take it as it comes. So for me, it was just, you know, six o'clock will come and then, you know, one of the guesses that I picked or something I didn't even think of will pop up. Six o'clock, it was gone. So it made me very nervous. You know, people need to rationalize situations, things they see. You know, even a kid, uh, you can see that. Uh, you know, mommy, what is that? That daddy, what is that? You know, it's constant when they're at a certain age. I wondered all day. I was pretty much on edge. I went to work. Um, <clears throat> people commented that I was a little shaken. Um, I didn't feel like I was shaken. I was just really deep in thought. You know, just what was that darn thing? Um, Never even got to the point of military or something like this. It was always just uh, trying to figure it out. And then it hit me about five hours into it. I had witnessed ball lightning. It's rare. I've read about it. You know, it's really neat. I didn't have a camera witness. I was laughing at myself. Doing the single father thing, you know, I left work, uh, got some groceries, came home. And, uh, yeah, I had a lot of neighbors in the area, you know, uh, Dead End Street, uh, 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 long story short, that evening, uh, around nine nine thirty in the evening, I don't smoke outside, but I do smoke, or I do smoke outside, not on the inside. Uh, I went out to smoke a cigarette, and I was looking up in the area, just laughing at myself, and uh, there it was. It just blinked on the entire thing, the entire thing, not lights on it. It, it was the entire thing blanked and went completely out. About fifteen feet to my right, it blinked on blink completely out did a complete circle doing that until it got above my head and then shot off over a cattle field so at this point my knees are shaking i have no idea what i saw and uh, i was a nervous wreck Uh, but that was uh, an absolute beginning of a full year of the hell that i probably hopefully never will repeat again Uh, the third sighting i won't mention um, but after that Neighbors started noticing. Uh, the object came down as low as 30 feet above my head. Um, it eventually got to the point where people would show up in front of my apartment on a daily basis, 
wanting to see the UFO and the UFO guy, uh, which I never <laughs> advertised to do so. Um, but usually when I'd come home, it would be about 20, 30 people at a time pointing at them. And, you know, if there's people up here, you know, where's your proof? There was a full investigative team that was on it for a full year. I've got proof of military harassment. I've got pictures. I've got videos. You name it, I have it. You name it, you know. Um, do I feel like I need to ruin my life trying to be a UFO guy and get out there and try to sell a book? No. I am a man. I'm a person. I'm a human being. I'm not a celebrity. I don't care to be. Does this information belong to people who want it? Absolutely, and I'll find a way to do so, but that's not as easy. You know, in the beginning, I was told about this UFO community. Well, I, I pictured, you know, as naive as I was, like cottages and everybody's mowing their lawns, you know. Uh, that turned out to be one big backstabbing, all kinds of crazed lunatic stuff I don't want to even get into right now, you know, because something that amazes, it, it just happens to a person. And you go to find out stuff, and you just get pummeled by these people. Uh, so when I heard about ufology, I thought maybe I can get an online class. You know, <laughs> I was that naive. I didn't know. I just absolutely didn't know. There's probably a few people out there that would, yeah. would uh, yeah. teach you, uh, take your money and teach you. Uh, to, this, to this day, and Milk Lane was a very short dead-end street uh, to show you how much activity with the helicopters, uh, the military harassment, the whole nine yards. Uh, turned out to be, you know, everyone on the street, 20 apartments on one side, three trailers on the other side. Most of these people couldn't afford to move. You know, this is just a place before you can get a place type of place. Um, they all moved. I was the last one to move from that apartment complex. And to this day, that happened in 2013. Um, no one has rented anything on that street. It's turned into an urban legend, you know. Um, people talk about it. And, you know, in the South, there's a lot of Baptists there, and, you know, you don't talk about these kinds of things. You know, I hear of kids going out there late at night drinking beers, wanting to see the lights in the sky. Um, but I don't hear a word that they ever do. But um, Is it, like, all run down and abandoned? Or? No, they just they just rebuilt them. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, the owner sold because he couldn't get anything. He couldn't rent them out. He couldn't rent anything out. So he sold them. And they were nice little two-bedroom apartments, you know, not bad at all. Um cheap on utilities, cheap on rent. And uh, a new guy from Colorado came in and fixed them up really nice and, uh, you know, kept low rent, you know, just to get people to move in, one-year lease type of deal, but nobody will move back there. Uh, um, well. the, the activity that happened, you would think there would be tanks, there would be military, there would be something, but it's, right. it's someone, not like the movies. Someone wants to know, can you elaborate on the military harassment? I can, I can. Um it first started, I'd like to say, you know, uh, I'm not a paranoid person. I don't look over my shoulder every two seconds. It has to be, and I've learned that I'm that stupid. It has to be right in my face before I go, okay, that's what this is, you know. And it was the third sighting when I realized that I was dealing with something very intelligent, very scary, and very much not us. Um, it, it, you mentioned earlier how hard it could possibly be. Yeah, right? I, I can't get into that much time. No, no. Um, Helicopter, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm, I can't really mention too many names. I don't want to, uh, but there were several, several witnesses. Um, but I was standing with a friend. I was looking at an object a couple hundred feet off the ground. Uh, they were quiet. They kept coming back. It was almost like a uh, timid deer, you know, just over the trees, backing away, coming closer. Um, the first helicopter, we never even heard it coming. It just came right behind us. The object took off the opposite direction, and it spotlighted us both. I mean, so close and slow low to the ground, I had to hold my hat on my head. And uh, you can see this guy's face, you know, with the uh, – this. I don't know why he was wearing sunglasses, but he was wearing sunglasses in the dark flying this helicopter. Um, after that, it was almost a daily routine. Um, I had a, a neighbor of mine, Debbie. Uh, she was a porter that worked at the uh, the hotel right down the street from us, and uh, she cleaned out, you know, the sheets and, and did the rooms and everything. She calls me up one day and says, you know, er, do you have family in town? Because this guy's got pictures of you and your kids all over his bed, all over the desk, paperwork on you guys. I said, Debbie, go to the office right now and get that man's name. Well, it turns out he's a retired lieutenant colonel that worked for the Pentagon for some time. He had relocated to that area, vacation, I don't know, but uh, he had a lot of information on me. Um, 
Unfortunately, I can't get a whole lot of information on him, even though I know his name. Uh, you work for the Pentagon, you're going to have stacks and stacks of paperwork on you. This guy mm -hmm. doesn't have much. Um, it did go on from there with uh, several other things, though. But uh, mm -hmm. as far as physical contact, no. They won't talk to you. They won't come near you. None of that. This um, longtime uh, UFO researcher had sort of been, he was sort of, uh, he has something to sort of reveal recently. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into too much detail other than um, I heard from him recently and he was being harassed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was harassed. A Kathy Harden published a picture of my helicopter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah you know, it was I, a black I, helicopter was right uh -huh. over his house <laughs> in his driveway. I can't tell. I can't tell. Yeah, he drove away um, because he had to go to his, drop his brother off or something. Mm -hmm. And the thing followed him, and he came back, and it, and it was over his house again. Mm -hmm. He went running in, and, his, and it had, he showed me a picture of it. Yeah, it and it had this ball of, on the front of it, and it was over his house. And he went on, and his router and his computer was going crazy. Mm -hmm. And he shut everything down. Well, he yeah, got to. They, they wow. Yeah, I guess I will, Audrey. I was... Uh, I was over at Audrey's house recently, and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to take a shower, and I went in to uh, take a shower in her spare uh, bathroom. <sighs> I can't believe you talked me into saying <laughs> this is all true. I'm not a paid actor, folks. Uh, this is actual, you know, people's lives here. I was taking a shower, and, you know, coincidentally, I was very, very, very soaked up. You know, I mean, I was just covered. My hair had the mohawk the whole night. Don't pretend like you haven't done it, but... <laughs> She has a skylight just above, you know, the, the shower there. And I hear this huge truck just going right by the, uh, the house. And I'm going, wow, that must be a big truck. I look up through the skylight, and there's a black helicopter hovering directly over the skylight. I am naked <laughs> as a jaybird, soaped up like that. Yeah. yeah. This is the kind of thing that does happen. And... Would I you ever were standing on your head? So, uh, <laughs> no, no, that was like, yeah, that was like, uh, yeah, that was like two minutes before. Yeah, she ran outside to take a picture, but uh, yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got plenty of photographic evidence. You know, that's what people want to see: evidence, 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 all the time. And uh, hopefully, I can find a way to get it out. I mean, I've been told by my investigators that this is a substantial amount as far as ufology and everything like that. But how to get it out, not to be, you know, picked on, ridiculed, this and that. You know, that's a hard thing. You know, I, I've got a family. I've got friends. I've got people that really don't want to get picked on or anything like that. But at the same time, this information needs to be, you know, it needs to be out there. Now, when you said this was, and we got just a couple minutes here to the top of the hour. That's why I kept looking at the clock. And, um, and we take just a quick little music break. And so when we do that... Um, before we do that, though, um, God, I totally lost my train of thought, and it's live radio, as from looking around here. Um, before we do that, can you um, just say what uh, organization was researching your your case? Was it an organization? Um, well, uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> the guy that uh, I found, luckily... Very much luckily. He goes by Kentucky Truth Seeker on uh, Facebook, and that's how I found him. I uh, was um, on the star team for 25 years for MUFON, and uh, a lot of his team was as well. Um, now, I, from what I know, MUFON had a little bit of a falling out years and years ago, and there was a lot of people that left, and uh, he has uh, been doing on it on his own you know, for 40 years, and um, he has been the best I could imagine. I mean, he wasn't there to go and collect evidence and run out. He would stay there with me, coach me, talk to me, never gave me his ideas or pushed his impressions on me, but just always made sure that I was okay. And I would not be a man sitting here in front of a microphone. I would be, you know, in a padded room somewhere. I could not handle my worldview being torn to pieces. Could mm -hmm. not handle it. Take care of two kids and go to work every day. There's just no possible way I could have handled that. And, um, I don't know how some people can handle it. There are people that aren't well-rounded. They don't know how to compartmentalize emotions, and it will destroy you. And people say, you know, I wish I had an experience. You know what? Be careful what you wish for. That's right. Well, that's it for Hour One. Thank you for supporting the show. So you're 
coming up to hour two right after the music break. We'll be right back. All right, this is Martin Willis, and we're back. Uh, you're listening live. We're in a little studio in Portland, Maine. I'm with uh, Dan Brew, Audrey Starborn, and Eric Mitchell. And, uh, Dan, we're, we're back. You, the microphone's in your hand. Um, and <clears throat> in general, um, w- well, first of all, when did you move um, to the state of Maine? How old were you when you m- moved here? And why? <laughs> uh, I just say that kind of funny because... We yeah. had such a bad winter, you know. Yeah, I don't have too many more in me like that. Yeah. Uh, well, my wife and I met you know, while going to college in Alabama, and uh, we got married and lived down there together for about six years. And we would come up and visit, and I've never lived anywhere where they had seasons. And we come mm-hmm. up in the winter, and you go skiing, you go snowboarding, and you come up in the summer, and it's not 100 degrees with 100% humidity, so... We, I just fell in love with it, and we've been up here since uh, 2003. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in your experience, you, you started this Facebook page, and mm-hmm. what has the interchange been with other people in Maine? Um, I mean, there are a lot of sightings. I mean, oh, yeah. Um, and how many people would actually join a Facebook page? It's awful hard to say, but, I mean, what do you, what do you hear overall? I think I have a, I don't have a great following. It's about 65 people so far, but the stories that I've heard and that people have shared with me are amazing. Yeah. I have one guy that lives in Bangor and he consistently sends photos that he's taken of craft in the sky and video. And he has uh, quite a bit of footage. I was quite surprised there was so much activity around Bangor. Yeah. But um, yeah. while I'm thinking about it, I want to address really quickly the commentator that was drilling Audrey for for evidence. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to say, and this is the misconception that a lot of people have, a lot of skeptics, that there's no physical evidence, when in fact the opposite is true. There is a mountain of physical evidence. There are metal samples, and the metal samples are interesting because they, while they are formed of, of earth metals that are present on our planet, they are all 100% pure. And we don't have a process that can produce metals and can strip metals to where they are 100% pure for creating metal objects. There have been radiation, uh, radio, radioactive traces left from landing sites. There have been uh, Dr. Robert Lear. Uh, Roger, Roger Lear, thank you. Who unfortunately is not with us anymore, but he made his life's work towards the end of his life to remove alien implants from people. And these have been sent to, uh, like, no, it was, um, I can't remember the name of the, out in the West, the lab, the lab, uh, mm, that's all right. I can't remember, but it was a very, uh, reputable lab and they did, uh, the work on it and they analyzed it and the founding, the, the what they found was amazing. The, the metals in it, once again, were a hundred percent pure. Uh, for some reason there was no, um, irritation to the skin where the implant was put in there was no entry mark and there was no 
hmm. no inflammation anywhere around the metal object. And, you know, these are people that came in and said they had an experience. They think they have something in their body. And they took the x-rays. Certainly there was something in there, and it was removed. Hmm. And there has been, uh, in landing fields, there's been the surrounding bushes and the surrounding grass has been altered to where it doesn't grow. It's been genetically altered. It doesn't grow like it did before. And in some cases, grass has never regrown at a landing site. Hmm. So there is plenty of evidence out there. There's plenty of uh, physical traces. Well, I've heard, I think it was Stanton Friedman, and I hope I'm not misquoting him in any way, but I think he said there's over 5,000 cases with uh, trace evidence, whether exactly. that's... And the government doesn't harass just anybody. You know? No. <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. I mean, there's, there's evidence that people you know, have been harassed and in some instances even killed. You know, there's a very dark side to this. If anyone knows anything about Philip Schneider, who, mm -hmm. hey, this guy was straight up murdered. You know, this is a man who has the background, who was a geologist uh, for, for the Army, I believe it was, who actually got in a firefight with a hive of aliens living in a cave underneath the, um, I think it was Dolce, uh, Mexico, the Dolce base he helped to, to build. Uh, that base, that underground base that's so infamous now. And he was actually involved in a firefight with these extraterrestrials, and uh, they ended up burning off three of his fingers, opening his chest, and uh, basically uh, sent electrical current through his head, through his entire body, and fried his toenails and fingernails off. I don't know about that story. I, I, really? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I know I know about the story, but I don't know how... Factual, that is. There's a lot of been a lot of controversy about is that. that. The one where he was supposedly digging and busted into. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, it was the Dolce you know. firefight. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, I just I, I've heard about it. I just mm -hmm. have heard a lot of uh, talk about whether this is credible or not. And I don't know. Yeah. I'm not saying one way or the other. You know. Well, uh, he supposedly killed himself by wrapping his catheter around his neck and slowly choking himself to death. And oh. for a man that was handicapped and had a pistol underneath his bed, you know, there are other ways to go about killing yourself than slowly strang strang slow strangulation. And I heard that all of his samples were taken, too, that they came up missing. Okay. Um, so, Audrey, do you have anything you want to add to that? <clears throat> um. Yeah, I don't know if anybody could hear me when I was talking just now, but uh, the the military just doesn't harass any um, average, you know, citizen, if you want to call it that. Um, I do have constant harassment, surveillance, and um, intimidation on me with what I do, obviously, now and who I am. Um, I do have a whole photo album of the helicopters that so kindly said hello to Eric in the shower the other day. Um, and these helicopters don't just fly by. They, they will sit above, you know, tree level and uh, just hover. And I do have a collection of photographs. Kathy Martin published one of them in her book with Denise Stoner, um, co-authoring The Alien Abduction Files. Um, she put a picture of the helicopter that I was one day doing dishes after an encounter. They do come in after abductions usually or whenever strange things happen. Um, at my house, um, and I was doing dishes, and they so kindly uh, were staring right at me through my window. Um, as I was doing dishes, uh, they, you know, that's what maybe ten feet off the ground, and proceeded to uh, stay all day. I finally just said, you know, they must be getting bored, and took a ride, and they followed me wherever wherever I went. So. Uh, you know, they don't just do this uh, to, to any average person, so there's got to be a reason. Um, I don't feel like I need to, to bring proof. Um, like w that we were just talking about, there's plenty of it out there. Um, do research, look it up, look at the statistics. Just, uh, you know, do your own looking, but they're, they're there. Um, and pretty soon, I think the world will know, you know, we're... We as experiencers feel um, very strongly that it, it, 
things are definitely picking up in, in our um, experiences, and things are happening. So, uh, you know, and like Eric said, be careful what you wish for um, because, you know, it just might happen. So I don't know if there's anything else you want me to cover. No, I um, wanted to, back to, to ask <coughs> Eric. <clears throat> Eric, um, since this um, situation you mentioned happened, who you're involved in, have have you? Um, this was not. Where was this hap Where did this happen? It was in exactly. It was in the Hot Springs, South Arkansas. Arkansas. Uh -huh. um, since this happened, did you start really looking? You know, being a skeptic of this whole thing to begin with. Did sure. you? You obviously started looking into the it, subject more and more. Th third sighting was definitely. Uh, yeah, you know, I I knew. Um, that it was something now did I want to call it alien did I call I, I, did I want to call it an angel you know uh, there's a, a huge spiritual um, aspect that happens um, when you get really close to one of these things and you, you you've got to wonder you know is this an angel is this an alien what is this but yeah I looked at it I think uh, you know I think they call it, they call it getting bitten by the UFO bug because um, it stays there in the back of your mind you're doing the dishes you're at work it doesn't matter what you're doing um it's always going to be there um and what about friends and family um all my neighbors were my friends um a single father um they all witnessed it they all saw they were all telling me why are you denying it we see it every day you know why are you the one denying this kind of thing and uh, i just didn't want to believe it you know what i wanted to do uh, is is go with the daydream that I had in the beginning is go to a psychiatrist, find out that I have some kind of delusory ideas or beliefs, get on medication for a good six months or so, and everything is fine after that. That's what I wanted, you know, wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, that is not what I got. You know, I've got a psychiatrist looking at me saying, have you ever heard of John Mack before? Hmm. That is not the direction I wanted to go. Hmm. Uh, I'd, 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 you know, anything else but this, you know, a science fiction thing going out in front of my house. I'd like to know that I ticked off a multimillionaire in grade school and he just decided to mess with me back, you know, anything but this. Um, but you, I went kicking and clawing. I did all the way. I mean, just all the way. Um, never been a Trekkie, never been a sci-fi fan, never been into it. Uh, you show me fact, you show me, you know. And to this oh, day. Oh, pardon me. Sure. Did uh, something just came to mind? Were there stories of this event happening before? No, you saw it. No, no. So it all you saw it when it began, as far as they, you know. They were well aware. Everyone in the neighborhood were well aware that uh, it was time to stand stand out in front of my apartment and when I was going to come home. They knew these things would come straight to me, and the more people backed away, the closer it got to me itself. Uh, so I realized that. Uh, I was the one, I don't know, in fear of time, I was going to get sucked up and, and took away or something like that. But it, it never happened. Um, other than one instance, I, I was only harmed once. And uh, I, I don't think that was uh, uh, intentional harm. I think it was something uh, entirely different. What happened? I, I I'll repeat that I, I, I don't want to discuss that, that night. Um, you know, it's something that uh, still uh, bothers me quite a bit. And uh, there is, you know, for the proof people, I would like a, a medical doctor to take a look at it. I would, you know, um, I've already had three and they've all three backed up and had blood pressure just rush straight to their face and go, whoa, you know. So, you know, until I can find a medical doctor to document and take a real hard look, a good biased, you know, stay away from the biased opinion doctors. I want someone to look at it vigorously and, and tell me exactly what they think it is and, and be willing to document it on paper. Then I'd be happy to talk about it. But until then, friends and family only. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm sure you'd be in the <laughs> same situation. Yeah. Now, you're speaking at the conference this year? Yes. yes. And is it the first time you've ever, you'll ever have spoken on the topic? Uh, I've done a couple of radio shows that was suggested to me to do by my investigator to kind of warn off. It seems if you speak out on radio, uh, these goons back off for a while. You'll notice the hacking will slow down on your computer or your phone. You'll notice that, uh, you know, less helicopters would be, you know, flying by the house. So it, it, it's just a quick fix to, you know, um, get that off your chest for a little while. But, um, yes, it will be my first time officially speaking, um, 
Okay. And uh, let's see. Let's try to think of a new topic. Okay. All right. We're, we're talking. Um, uh, let's talk about. Does someone want to pick a subject? I know this is live and casual. Oh. <laughs> but we can talk about hoaxes. We can talk about. I can um, I can throw mythology. out some advice to uh, to many people that have uh, gone through this situation. Um, you know, you start with rationalization. You you start to reach out. You go into denial, and what I've seen uh, just with my naked eye, you know, because I have not looked into the subject my whole life, I see a lot of people standing on stage going rationalize, rationalize, rationalize when this process needs to move for, further into to different things. And uh, I think a lot of people stay stuck for 20, 30, 40 years on one aspect of the, the whole ride, and, and they stay there. Thank you for the guys that rationalize everything, for people that don't understand what's going on. But it's a process like a, a, a death of a family member. You really have to, uh, as a person, grow um, with this and, and, and get to uh, a better place with it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, someone wants to know if you – changed your name to Audrey Starburn to protect your privacy? Um, no, I mean, my name's out there. Uh, both are, is out there. Um, I just became known as Audrey Starborn because of Starborn support. Uh, so that's basically what I go by. And, of course, it's on Facebook. But, yeah, my name's out there publicly. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, not uh, you know, I mean, it's been suggested to, you know, change it but you know what i'm who i am you know this is me so really there's no need to it's people obviously know who i am so yeah now um so you're <clears throat> also involved in the same group that christina's involved um yeah i do um some of the support um work with uh, free the uh, foundation for research into extraterrestrial encounters and i'm on the advisory board yes mm-hmm and that uh, that's a new thing that's being put together, and um, it's, it's interesting, uh, and I like to be part of that. And actually, we're uh, you know we're so busy with the 24-hour hotline, and I've been doing this since 2006. Um, it's actually helping me kind of uh, you know lighten the load too. So yeah, um, Ray Hernandez uh, actually. He's the co-founder. Um, he's uh, very outspoken spoken about this. And he uh, came to me and had had an experience where he had been shown um, this wheel. And it was interesting because it was Kathy Martin that had put two and two together and told him to call me because I had been shown um, the wheel back in 2006 uh, around the time they told me to start the group. And kind of obsessed about it for, you know, the first few um, interviews and just asking, has anybody seen this wheel? Has anybody seen this wheel? And nothing. So I kind of just, you know, put it in the back of my mind and, and really didn't think about it until Ray called me um, a couple of years ago almost now and mentioned the wheel. And I said, hold on. And I went and I dusted off a journal from 2006 and took a picture of my drawing of the wheel and sent it to him. And he said, you know, it was um, an instant connection there and uh, kind of brought us to, you know, working together. And it's really interesting the way things, uh, you know, work in this field and the high strangeness that surrounds it is uh, pretty amazing. And um, almost all of us, I mean, I take I, one of the questions at every support group and meeting we have is who's had a near death experience and is a, an, an abductee or a contactee. And um, I'd say 99% so far. I mean, everybody has had a near death. And it's quite interesting to, to put the serious? two and I've two never, together. Now, I've, I've asked um, Kathy Martin a couple of different times. Mm-hmm about the commonalities and that's yeah. nothing that's ever come up. Yeah, that's that's one that's uh that we're researching in um deeply now. Uh actually the near death studies is part of uh of free. It's a whole division that we're doing. Um because we're finding that it is so common. And you know, the it's not always like in my case, I mean I've been an experiencer all my life and my near death happened in two thousand and four. But it, that was at the time when my whole 
spirituality. Um, it was a very spiritual awakening. And that was when I came out of that ocean, a different person. So um, it, it did increase awareness, uh, change my whole being. And, uh, and of course, there was um, a sense of, you know, wow, this is, is quite amazing. Um, you know, I went into the ocean and got taken by a rip current and it was very fast. It was instantly. I had only gone up to my knees because um, I was actually scared of the ocean, but I was in Florida. I said, I'm going to go into the ocean today. And in seconds, I went out, uh, got taken by a rip current, and uh, a man I was with uh, was at the end of the rip current, was able to get out, and he swam his way back to shore to get me help. And there was my aunt and uncle were on the shore. There was three people there I was with. They were all on the beach. I uh, got sucked out to to the ocean. I remember, um, you know, fighting for my life, basically, and thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to die, and watching the beach, and the people getting smaller and smaller, and they were ant-sized. And then I saw the lights and, and the emergency vehicles and hundreds of people. I remember thinking, you know, this is all for me. Wow, you know. And the next thing I know, I was above my body looking down at myself and you know, watching, and that's, you know, like I said before, was when I started thinking about my family, you know, because it was really, um, I was at that point where it was like, wow, this isn't bad at all, you know, I'm, I'm going to die, but this, you know, I had no fear in me. The only fear was how my loved ones would, you know, be watching me die and then find out. And so, uh, you know, as I'm above my body thinking all this and life flashing uh, before my eyes, I was suddenly sucked back into my body and was fighting the waves again. And I hear, Audrey, Audrey, my name's being called. Um, it's coming from the right of me. And I look and I see a man, uh, it was a blonde man floating on some kind of a blue flotation device um, with these amazing eyes that were glowing almost. Um, he said, Audrey, take this rope. This next wave's going to do us in. So I did, and I wrapped it around my wrist, and that's the last thing I remember until I was on the beach, and the, there was four or five lifeguards resuscitating me. And, and I sat right up. I, I said, you know, where's the blonde that saved me? There's a blonde. Where's the blonde? And I was freaking out. And they said, no, no, there was five lifeguards. We, you know, we almost had to call the Coast Guard. And then they took off quick, and it turns out that uh, 14 people died. Uh, I was the only one that lived in the rip current. So... Um, the man I was with that was able to get out of the rip current saw the blonde guy, and he had always stood by me and said he was there. And I was concerned that there was somebody out there, you know, going to die that just saved me. So I, you know, put a, um, a request out on a radio show, you know, if, the, if, if you're the blonde that saved me, just please, you know, I want to thank you. I went to the library to see if maybe it was a ghost. I didn't think E.T. I didn't think all that. Um, the man that was with me said, you know, you had a guardian angel. I saw him, and he was there, and he, he was always um, one to talk about it to everyone. And when I was in the hospital, um, they were checking my lungs and such. You know, I just drowned. So um, we looked at my arm, and there was rope burns on my arm. So it did happen. You know, there was evidence right there. So people... Um, you know, were just like, you know, who's this guy? And I, I didn't think about it for, you know, as um, this was, you know, uh, an ET encounter. You know, I was at that point still um, really confused on the subject and not educated at all about it. And then, you know, like I said, that's when the vision started happening and I started to see, um, you know, have premonitions about events that were occurring, um, you know, they were really trying to get my attention, basically, and uh, just packed up one day and came, actually ended up in Maine because my mother had bought a house here. Uh, my parents bought a house here. Um, and uh, I liked it, and I stayed, and that's, you know, when things started to increase. And then I started to uh, understand that uh, the greys are just one, one race and one part of this phenomenon. Um, but, yeah, the more I talk to people, in fact, there's one... Um, man that uh, is, is writing a book where some of my um, my stories in it, uh, Reverend John Polk, he's also part of Free. He um, had a near death, his near death in that same body of water in Florida at Ormond Beach Day Dawn and Line. I mean, it was the same exact thing, so it was pretty pretty uh, impressive. It was March 21st, and I just re you know realized recently, oh, it was the equinox, you know, so that's, and I'm just trying to, to put this together. It was a very uh, 
profound, it had a profound effect on my life and changed me for the better. So, yeah, I began to uh, investigate, you know, how many people have had near deaths. And just through my support groups where we've got our support group in Maine and one in Massachusetts. And uh, combined, we probably have uh, 100 or more people, you know. So I do. I throw that question out there, and it's it's pretty impressive. And I think we asked uh, a couple of years ago at the conference, you know, for, for the experiencers to, to, you know, how many have had near deaths, and, and it is a huge percentage. Um, someone wants to know if you can elaborate on the premonitions um, well, you know, a lot of it, uh, at that time, it was more personal. Um, say there was a vision I had of a child, and um, I, like I said, I had, had a falling out with my sister, um, and that was the first time ever we hadn't spoken in any extended amount of time. So I had called her because, uh, you know, the vision was it was her child. And I called her, and I said, you know, you're pregnant, it's a girl, and, you know, she's special. And I hung up, and, you know, she was like, I'm not pregnant, rah, rah, rah. And, you know, within, you know, the next month or so, she called me up, and she said, I am pregnant. And, you know, it did turn out to be a girl. Um, little things like that, there would be, you know, I'd see something, um, a flash, or get some kind of a, of a message, and then it would happen. Um, now they're, they're more profound now, um, global events. Um, and I get messages not only in... Uh, visions, uh, I guess, you know, people would call that scrying, or, but I get the visual, it's like watching a movie in my head. Um, I also get audio messages, like, they're not, it's like somebody's talking to me, but not in my head, not like thinking, it's somebody, it's like somebody's right next to me, talking to me, I like have to turn just to make sure there's nobody standing there, and they'll tell me things. Um, sometimes it's little things that I'll write down, doesn't make any sense at the time, and then I'll get another part of that message um, that comes in later and and put that together. So, you know, it's it's like, uh, like I said before, a puzzle. And, uh, you know, I had gotten one message uh, the night of the, the Russian meteor hit, I think, and and I had told Kathy Martin, and we, we talk a lot, we're really close, and she um had brought Denise on, on our radio show, Starborn Support Radio, and they were both talking. And Kathy said, you know, tell Denise your message. And I did, and, and Denise happened to have another piece of the message I got. So, you know, that's when we really started to say, all right, we do have a puzzle here. And now it's just about um, getting people together. And like I said, we are gathering. We're, we're finding each other. We're, um, you know, just it's... The high strangeness again. Um, we form very tight bonds very instantly. It's a soul connection, a soul family. Um, nothing like I've ever experienced. Um, we can pick each other out of a crowded uh, uh, auditorium. You know, it's an energy signature that we give off. And, you know, I say, that's, you know, she's an experiencer, he's an experiencer. It's uh, pretty amazing. And the energy created when we're all together is, is amazing. Uh, last year, we had a gathering um, of 40 of us at my mom's lake house, and we were able to, to vector in a UFO right in uh, Otis Field on Thompson Lake. Um, and, you know, it was and, and not only that, it was a bunch of other um, strange things. Uh, Michael Cleland actually blogged about it on his uh, website, Hidden Experience. He was there, and He's the one that studies the owls and lectures about the owls and experiencers. And there were so many um, experiences just with him there with these owls. So it was, uh, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, people, you know, have such closed minds. But it's just, uh, you know, open your mind and at least, you know, hear people out, do the research. It's out there, you know. I mean, just the global conditioning and the the fear and and the cover up that's been going on so long. It's it's quite easy for people to dismiss the subject, and even easier for the government to cover it up now. I mean, there could be a thousand real UFOs that have been reported, but they throw one weather balloon up or or one hoax, and that's all it takes to discredit all of them in most people's minds. So, uh, but the reality is, is if even one isn't explainable, then there is, the, you know, that's enough. You know, it, it's it, just one that can't be explained, and, and the numbers are so much higher than that. So, uh, you mentioned just a minute ago that 
You can pick each other out mm -hmm. in a gymnasium or whatever. So what happens when you you look at someone mm -hmm. and you just think it? Do you actually, who broaches the, does the um, subject get broached? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it happens all the time. I'll be in Walmart and you just randomly, you know, run into someone and, and you just start talking about it. Um, it it's, uh, you know, it's different with everyone, but it's not something that we're embarrassed about or nervous about. It's, you know, hey, I know you. Like, a um, perfect example, when I was talking about Matt Moniz, we were introduced to him on a craft um, and then 10 years later, run into him in a club um, doing sound for my brother's band. And we instantly said, okay, they, you know, we met on the spaceship. And I just walked right over to him, put my arm around him and say, hey, you know, you remember us? And he's like, oh, wow. And we just, you know, bust into it. So uh, the recognition is, uh, is pretty phenomenal. It is, a, you know, like I said, a soul tribe or a soul family. We, um, we all have just such a deep connection um there's no and in most cases there's no drama there's no competition there's just love you know and we all get together and last year during our gathering the press was there and they were just watching and there was people from england you know just from all over the planet sitting around this fire um and just they couldn't believe the uh the calmness and the the laughter and the connection that we all had together you know and i mean everybody cries when it's time to go you know back to back to so-called normal society we want you know to stay in that in that energy and and create that all over the planet that's what it's about it's about you know the love the connection the the energies and when we're together i mean the animals come out of the woods and hang out with us for christ's sakes you know it's it's it is a sense of um <sighs> I don't even know what the word is. You know, it's like Eden when we're all together and we create this and just with the energies. And that's what has to happen on this planet for it to be able to continue. And for, um, you know, we have to get back to that, you know, oneness and that connection with everything that is um, earth and, and become one with one another. And nobody's better. Nobody, you know, just let go of that ego and, you know, find your soul and your love and, and uh, connect that way. And then everything that lives uh, becomes part of you. You know, that's how it is. There's times, two questions that kind of back and forth here. <clears throat> uh, maybe someone asked them wrong. Have you harassed the military <laughs> or has the military harassed you? <laughs> 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 Oh, believe me, if I if water. I had my chance, I would certainly harass. Um, there has been some pretty bad things that have happened to me from them. Um, that's a whole other subject for a whole other day. Um, but uh, they they harass me, uh, and you know it's it's pretty apparent. Not only did I you know get saved from you know almost drowning, they they also protect me because there has been some pretty serious stuff that happened to me. Um, but like I said, I haven't even be swallowed that myself yet, but, uh, there are plenty of witnesses to what happened it was, uh, last year. So, uh, you know, as we put these pieces together and as I come, you know, calm down about it, because I really, I could just go off and start harassing them right now, but I won't, um, m more adult than that. And, uh, it's a serious subject, so uh, I'm going to do it uh, the right way and just spread awareness and educate the you know people. Global about events, it. can you elaborate on? Um, you know, certain earthquakes I've seen, um, certain volcanoes I've seen. Uh, like I said, the the meteor I saw. Um, just you know, things of that nature. I did see several things that haven't happened yet, um, and you know, it's just okay. What's going to happen? I saw one nuclear uh, mushroom cloud. Uh, it was at least a tactical. Yeah. Don't know where, don't know when. Um, hopefully it's not going to happen. I always hope that it doesn't. But, yeah, there, there's one um, for sure that I've been shown. And it, Well, you know, uh, to me, I always wonder... Is there such thing as just one nuclear? Right. Well, I mean, that's all cloud. it takes, you know. I'm, I'm, and yeah. I was thinking, you know, I hope that it re represents, you know, Fukushima or something. You know, maybe that was, you know, the vision was trying to say, you know, this nuclear. I'm trying to dismiss it as not what it is, but it, it's it's one, you know. Um, 
And you, know, you, you pay close attention to that. And that's all it'll take is one. So, you know, I mean, let's yeah. hope let's hope it's not. So, um, Eric, have, um, I'm just going to ask straight out, do you believe that you were abducted? <sighs> that's a toughie. Um, <clears throat> I have no memory whatsoever of, of abduction. However, I do have, um, <laughs> you know, marks that I took to doctors as long, you know, as way I took my children in as well and had everything looked at. And, uh, uh there's no explanation on several occasions. Um, do I want to believe that happens? No, mm -hmm. no. But, um, you know, I'd like to say I'm on the fence, but I'm really not. Uh, you know, I know that kind of things happens, but I can't wrap my head around it. I really can. I, I cannot do hypnosis right now. No, no, I am not ready. Uh, there's a lot, you know, even with uh, uh, a lot of occasions, I, I keep forgetting. It's almost like my either my brain can't handle it or, or something. But, you know, my kids and my neighbors said, why don't you remember this? Why don't you remember that? I had woken up one morning and... Uh, there's a lot of things I don't want to say, but uh, myself, I, I had holes. And I don't mean little puncture marks. I don't mean little gnats have eaten, been eating me. Look, you raise four kids in Arkansas, you know every bite, every rash, everything out there, okay? It's not like you don't know. Uh, and, and, you know, on top of that, all the remedies to go with it. But when you have hundreds, and I mean literally hundreds of holes that you can put a full drop of water in, in each one, completely dehydrated, and lasting months and months at a time and you find out your daughter has it and your son has it and it happened one night you rush to the doctor i've known this doctor for 15 years okay and we've met and he's going i do not know what this is you know so that's just a, a fragment of the nightmare the biggest part of the nightmare is knowing that you love and care and cherish your children with all you heart your heart you can't do anything and nothing about it and do you want us to think that it's an abduction? No. You well, you always try to find a rational situation for it. But, you know, How are there's, they handling it? Hmm? How are they handling A lot better than me. Hmm. A lot better than me. Um, how about some of those, um, I'll just put this out there. Uh, I guess it's maybe directed to you. How about some of those positive premonitions you hear about? Uh, premonitions. Uh, uh, premonitions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess maybe for Audrey. Yeah, I haven't mentioned um, anything like that of myself. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's okay if you haven't. <laughs> you yeah, haven't you know, I, I, I really wish um, I could uh, could go there, but you know, I mean, they've gave me a sense of. Um, the planet is going to be okay. You know, they're not going to let it be destroyed. Um, and they've also hinted to, you know, whatever is used against us um, to harm um, could easily be transmuted into doing something good. So uh, it's hard to explain, but let's just, you know, use, uh, I don't know, chemtrails just to throw out there. I'm not saying that, you know, I know what they are. I don't say that was... Um, you know, as the conspiracy theorists say, a weapon to harm. Um, you know, the ETs, they, they, they have the ability to, to change things. Now, when it comes to, you know, let's just say the, the karmic law, you know, you, you do something to me, it comes back to you three times. Now, if, if the, say, the bad guys, for lack of a better term, um, use something to harm, now, they're not going to go and... and do something to harm them back because that's just not the way they are. They're benevolent um, and, you know, spiritual and, uh, you know, very enlightening. So they're going to do something good back at them. So, you know, say the chemtrails are harming us, they would turn it around and do make the chemicals either um, healing if they're harming, you know, people and animals or um, make it rejuvenate the earth if it's, you know, harming crops and things like that. So, you know, that has been a recent um, thing that they have been focusing on me with, with my uh, communications with them is, you know, they will turn around and use anything that is there to harm. So, you know, say this mushroom cloud does happen, which I don't think it will. They've um, been able to 
shut them off. You know, it's been proven. I mean, they they come over nuclear bases, they shut them off. They have that ability, you know. So they, you know, they're throwing a a bomb at us. You know, they will stop it. But you know that you know that, again. That's why I'm hoping that that just symbolized. Um, a nuclear event, which it was around the time of Fukushima, so I'm hoping, you know, okay, um, Fukushima is a whole other story now. You know, it's it's another thing that is, uh, yeah, and that's not ongoing and can yeah. be ongoing for a long yes, time. Yes, yes. All right, so I'm going to ask uh, Dan. I'm going to ask you a philosophical question. So um, let's just say that oh, there's billions and billions of planets out there with life and at least uh, a few billion planets with intelligent life in the cosmos. Why us? Why would these other beings come to see us from other... I mean, why don't they go to other places and why they? Why do they come to us? Well, what do you think about that question? Who's to say they don't go to other places? Mm-hmm. You know, who's to say it's interesting that... It's interesting to me that sightings didn't really start in earnest until the late 1940s. Of course, they've been happening for tens of thousands of years. You can go look back into the cave art and see clear depictions of UFOs and you know space space beings. But if you look at the late 40s, when sightings really started to pick up, it happened after the first nuclear bomb detonation. Mm-hmm. And the theory is that once they detonated a nuclear bomb, it sent shock waves throughout the universe, which kind of acted as a beacon where all of a sudden neighboring planets and neighboring galaxies just said, what was that? The kids are playing the yeah. matches. Yeah. Oh, hell. The kids found the matches. Uh-huh. Exactly. And I think now that not only are we capable of such destruction on a planet-wide basis now we have the capability of taking that destruction off of our planet and into other worlds Hmm. and i think um i read recently that russia came out and said that they have the power to summon ufos now no and uh, (laughs) we can all do it too all it takes is moving around a nuclear weapon now now wait a minute i want to hear more about this what uh what type of format was this who said who said this in Russia? In Russia? Oh, to be honest, I don't remember. It's an article I saw online that I thought was a joke. Yeah. But there's some truth to it. And it wasn't we can – we actively try to summon UFOs. They, the article goes to, to read that every time that they are moving nuclear missiles or nuclear warheads from one location to the other, they tend to show up. Hmm. Just as Audrey was saying with the with – the, sightings at the different missile installations in our own country. Richard Salas? Is, yeah. Is that Robert. His Robert Salas? Yeah. Yeah, and he's testified that they had one hover over his base. He was a base yeah. commander, and they shut down. Well, he wasn't a was commander, 20, but, but it, yes. Yeah. Um, he's been on the show. Yeah, um, 20 different s- silos and m- spread miles apart. All of them were activated at the same time and yeah. then shut down. Oh, sorry. And uh, I heard uh, at one point then in Russia that not only were the silos, the, the missiles activated, but the launch sequence yep. was activated. That's right. At the height yep. of the Cold War. Yeah. And so. And shut down, but I mean. That was- yeah, and then shut down at the last possible moment. If that doesn't send a clear message, That's- I don't know what does. You know, basically stop messing with this. Yeah. And so to get back to the original question. I think personally that this planet is a valuable resource for them. I think they have a vested interest in this planet, and I think that they utilize our resources. I've heard that our planet is one of the most uh, diverse planets uh, and due to life forms and fauna, and that we just have a very, very special place to live that we're not doing a very good job of taking care of right now. Um, Okay, the question is, you know, why are they interested um, in coming here? 
and obviously um, they're interested in, in protecting it. Now, the Earth is part of an ecosystem as well, which is our solar system. If the Earth is affected, it will have a domino effect throughout the universe. So we're not only, um, you know, playing with something that doesn't belong to us, it belongs to everything and is part of everything. So to harm this would have a greater effect everywhere, you know? It's just like when you take the smallest uh, organism out of an ecosystem, the whole rest of the um, system collapses uh, from the smallest to the largest thing. So the Earth is, is here for a reason. It's part of something bigger, and uh, it is connected to everything. And that's, you know, by hurting her, you're hurting yourself, and you're hurting everything else that exists here um, in the universe, in all the universes. So it will have a domino effect, and not one species is allowed to have that much power to uh, not only do we destroy our own kind, um, we're taking you know, animals to extinction every day um, at a rate that is quite alarming, and uh, it's just sick if you think about it. It really is, and there, there is no excuse. Um, so, yeah, we're not allowed to, to destroy and. The kids did find the matches, and once we were able to threaten the rest of the universe, they need to take. They need to step up. We're no longer playing in the sandbox here. We're, uh, you know, playing with the, the big guns, and uh, that's not going to be allowed to continue. Um, before I really got involved in this many, many years ago, now I've probably said this five or six times on my hundred and forty some odd shows, whatever I have. But um, I had a insurance broker that came to my house for life insurance, I'd say about 25 years ago, I guess it is now. And he said that he was part of a special um, Air Force unit that investigated UFOs mm -hmm. during uh, Vietnam. And there was a lot of action happening in Vietnam at that time. And he said mm -hmm. there were, he said even during napalm uh, bombings, there were, you know, sightings over and over and over yeah. again. And um, so the question I asked him that, Night, I said, well, what are they and why are they here? <clears throat> and he basically said that we're a Petri dish. Mm -hmm. That's He said that's the nearest thing I can describe yeah. what the government's theory is. Mm. But, you know, I, never, I was never able to. I was hoping someday I'd get a call or an email from him that he found my show or something because mm -hmm. he obviously was interest, interested enough, and I've never heard from him. But I'd well, like to. If you're out there, Tom, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know his last name. Um, so. <laughs> Um, someone wants to know if if they could actually do something, then why why didn't they fix uh, Fukushima? Now I did hear uh, there is there is a, a story. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's real or not, but um, what, Chernobyl was supposedly something that happened. Yeah, to yeah. Um, um, Fukushima is you know it's happening. Um, obviously, it's going to have consequence, and it's supposed to you know you know isn't that enough to show people you know this is. You know, this is what can happen. Now, Fukushima was also started by uh, a natural event, um, which, you know, triggered it. Uh, it will, I'm sure, be cleaned up uh, by the ETs. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how little focus the world has on that right now because that's huge. But uh, they're, they're distracting and they're, they're focusing on other things. They're throwing bombs at mount or planes at mountains again. And it's just... Um, it's all, I think they're going to s need a total breakdown of um, everything that people are, believe in. Because for people to accept the change that's coming and to be able to welcome our visitors, which again are completely telepathic, you know, they, they couldn't come here right now, you know, and, and actually function in the, the low vibration frequency that we're creating with our own bad energies. So a lot of them um, can't. So, you know, people like me and others um, are here, you know, as the ground crew. That's what we like to refer to ourselves as. So we're doing, you know, a lot of the work here um, to prepare. But uh, they, they, humans need a, a complete lack of anything else to come and save them um, and, and to, to come to, you know, to that point of, you know, we're, we're not going to fight anymore. Um, there's nothing else we can do. We're doomed. There's nothing There's nothing here. There has to be a breakdown, I think, completely in order to build up again 
and uh, bring the 1111 uh, laws back to say this is how you do it. Again, you know, there's been, you know, three times at least where they have had to come in and assist, whether, you know, you believe in the biblical sense, um, you know, people ask for the proof. You know, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of proof in that. It's, of course, been edited and altered and used as a, more of a control thing now. But uh, there's, there's more, a lot of mention of strange uh, things in the sky. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, the Hopis know, most Native tribes know, they still have their teachings and beliefs, and they know that uh, they'll be back to, to show us the way again. But unfortunately, the, this old way has to uh, has to end for for a new beginning. Now, the thought comes to mind as far as abductions go. Why doesn't, uh, say, a major politician get abducted, like, in whatever country? You know, why don't they? Do someone you know that could actually. No. So, <laughs> Have you I met a you, Yeah. You'd be, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, you'd be very surprised. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, politicians. So you're I, saying I, that there possibly is, but they're not talking about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, what would happen? I mean, you could see what the pilots who see it with their own eyes in the sky don't even report it because of what happened to the last guy that reported it. Okay, so, so that was probably a very naive question I asked. Well, they, they, it happens to everyone. It is not discriminative. No, it does not discriminate. And are you, I mean, are you aware of anyone? Like, uh, I'm, let's just say... Maybe not a celebrity. I mean, and I I know of that actress that um, said that she was abducted. But Shirley are you aware Mc of anyone that Shirley has Mc quietly come forward? I don't need to know uh, any names. Oh but. yeah, oh yeah. We've got a whole list of of people. Not only um, you know celebrities, but uh, um, different uh, musicians and and people like that. Yes, um, many actually. <laughs> There's a lot more than you think. Now I know that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you and Travis Walton are fairly close. Yes. And, you know, yes. he was up at your lake house mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, was he was he one of the people there when that UFO came over? Um, no, well, uh, he wasn't there last year. He'll be there this year. But, um, no, but uh, Stephen Bassett was there. Um, oh, he was? Huh? Yeah, yeah. And, um, gosh, I can't. You know, that's Denise funny you Stoner. say Stephen Bassett was there because um, I was watching him on some show in... Someone asked him if he ever saw a UFO, and he mm -hmm. said no. He didn't. So this, he didn't. It was, was so funny because he, he waited and waited and waited, and, it, and uh, I think the press, all their batteries drained, so they left, and, and people, we had been waiting, um, and then, uh, you know, half the crowd got up and was, you know, they had to pee or, or get back up the hill because we were down on the beach. So Steve was one of the people that walked up to the top of the hill and heard everybody go, woohoo. But if you know Steve Fermani, um, he's a 40-year MUFON investigator. Yeah. He used to be a you know, very argumentative deba debate of skeptic on the whole subject. He, he was there, and he's had a complete uh, paradigm shift and is now lecturing about his new beliefs. And he's also had some more personal experiences when he, come, he came to my house. So, oh. yeah, he's a, he's a new man, let's just say. He's reborn. We only, we only have a couple of minutes left. Only two minutes left. Mm -hmm. So um, do you want to just give um, the details one more time of your conference and yeah. who's there for speakers? Oh, um, this year we have um, Chris Bledsoe is coming back, um, Travis Walton, Denise Stoner, Eric will be speaking. Um, I wish I had the list in front of me. Um, I know. <laughs> so bad. These things take a great so deal. So bad. Of effort yeah, and to you know it's been, it's the fourth year, and it's like I've, I haven't stopped since the first one. So don't miss. Yeah, it is. Um, the the complete list. There's we have a Facebook page, Experiencers Speak, and the complete list can be found at uh, StarbornSupport.com on the events page. But uh, yeah, we have a, a great lineup, and um, you know we hope to keep doing this um, year after year to to have people. You know, come and learn. Uh huh. Come and talk to him. And uh, Dan's uh, page that he admins is UFOs over Portland, or is it Portland, Maine UFO Group? <laughs> I really got that one bad. <laughs> Portland, Maine UF. Portland, Maine UFO Group. And I'm going to just put this out there: you don't have to live in Maine to uh, join the group. 
No, not at all. I have a couple of members from Spain and uh, different, yeah, different Spain. countries wow. that I have yeah. to use the translator on Facebook to know what they're telling me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's so, a great video. I've got a lot of uh, photos and a lot of debunked photos and UFOs and ancient art and uh, a lot of our government documents released under the Freedom of Information Act that people can research. And yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Well. Um, I have really. Oh, did you want to say anything real quick? Because we have 30 seconds left. Great. You're all set. <laughs> all right. And um, it's been a real pleasure um, with all of you. And I really appreciate that you took the time out of your day. And you drove down from Poland. Well, uh, yeah, Poland, well, Maine. Little, yeah. yeah. Oxford. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I appreciate that. And you're you're right nearby. I rode my scooter from Newberry Street. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's it for the show today, mm-hmm. and I want to uh, uh, thank everyone for helping out Alejandro Rojas. He was on earlier. Our guests, of course, and um, there's no show notes this week. And next week, um, we should have uh, – we're supposed to have a major guest on. I can't announce it because I'm just waiting for confirmation. So if he doesn't pull through, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. And um, so – Again, uh, uh, that's it for the show. We do have uh, T-shirts available on our website. That's podcastufo.com. And uh, check it out. We usually have show notes, and we have blogs coming up with Michael Lauk. And so thank you. We'll be here next week at the Dark Matter Radio Network and every Wednesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And see you next week, and keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>